there's people in the Marines that are that are artists, that are ex sports people that have they've done all weird and wonderful things and go on to do all weird and wonderful thing, things after. Because I think if I thought if they find this, they're hundred percent going to rip it up. The stereotype is is that everybody thinks that you're just this mindless killer. Mainly the Americans would, would leave. And all we did for that year was reassure them that it wouldn't happen. Gareth, how are you, brother? I'm very well, thanks, Chris. How are you doing? Yes, good, mate. Always good to chat to a fellow Royal Marines commando. And I'm saying that specially because apparently YouTube recognizes the first words in your in a in a video, and that's what it goes on to prom to promote it. Really? So wow! Wow! If I, yeah. If I don't, my some of my videos I think don't get many views because I normally just start by "All right, mate." Yeah, and then we chat about the weather, <laughs> and then we chat about whatever nonsense is going on, and uh, yeah, then we get on to the the subject. But Gareth, absolutely massive. Um, congratulations on, on your book, Becoming the 0.1%. Here we go, folks. There'll be a link below. I suggest everyone reads it, military, non-military, whatever, because it's just a cracking book. Um, it, it covers a time that many of us boys had at a place called Limston Commando, the Commando Training Centre Royal Marines. And it, it, it's a great read for anyone, but for those of us that went through, it will certainly bring back a few memories. Um, 34 lessons from the diary of a Royal Marines commando recruit. They said Royal Marines again there, so this, this video is going to hit, mate. We're having it. How to be, build an elite mindset by Gareth Timmins. RM, which stands for Royal Marines, by the way, if I didn't mention it. Mate, what I loved, the first thing um, that I hadn't really thought of before, people often say, you know, how tough is it to get a green berry or, or, or whatever? And I always try to give an approximation of how many people go in the recruiting office and try, and, and some people will fail there and then, the, the Recruiting sergeant will look at them and go, "We're not having this one." <laughs> um, not, not, not in a nasty way, but you know, it's it, it's not for everybody. Um, we had to recruit Hanson in our troop, Gareth, and um, oh, I sh shouldn't probably have said his name. I hope hope he doesn't mind. But we all fell in on the parade square about week three, I think. Uh, the drill sergeant called us up to attention. Hanson, prove. Right, double away to the training team's office. And off he went. And uh, the, drill, the drill corporal just turned to us and went, take one last look at Hanson, men. Hanson is a teddy bear. And there's no room in the Royal Marines for teddy bears. Right? By teddy bear, folks, I don't mean gay. I mean, he was just a very soft and gentle um, a soft and gentle lad. He was absolutely lovely. Every, everyone fought the world of him. He used to sing us off to sleep at night when he was doing his ironing. But as I say, it's not for everyone. No. And so I've always tried to give an approximation of how many people go to a recruiting office and how many actually get, get their green lid. But you've captured it up very well with, with one in a thousand. So that that not just not just the one percent that the recruiting adverts say, but 0.1 percent of which you are one. And yourself. Yes. Has how's how's the book been received? Really well, mate. It's been uh it's just blown me away. It's been absolutely incredible. There was a lot of energy uh prior to publication and it's it's taken quite a while it took months to go through the mod which we were all quite kind of nervous about but 
I mean, how it's been received, mate, it's just been unbelievable. The feedback, the energy, uh, it's been bestseller on on Amazon. It's just, it's just, just been fantastic, mate. Really, 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 just delighted. Yeah, what is it about the Marines that produces so many best-selling authors? Is it? I, it's just, I, I think, the, the way that they've they've created it's a brand, isn't it? I think the way they've they've created the Royal Marines brand and the the just the amazing adverts that they've had over the years, uh, and the, obviously the length and and how difficult it is once people become aware of it, it just creates so much mystery and intrigue, and people just want to know, don't they? Whether you're interested or not in the military, people just are fascinated by it. So the other side of the coin, though, you know, writing a book is not it's no mean feat. It, it's utter dedication talking anything up to 18 hour days for for anything up to two two years um and also you've got to have kind of the the acad- not academic but the the literary stuff to to make it happen and i think that says a lot about the the quality of the of the men that find themselves in the marines absolutely i mean The, the the diversity in the Marines and what you get is is quite unbelievable, isn't it? You you can have like there's people in the Marines that are that are artists, that are ex sports people, that have they've done all weird and wonderful things and go on to do all weird and wonderful thing, things after. Uh, and you just end up with a network of of people that are often quite exceptional in all different kind of fields of whatever they go into, but. It does. It attracts. It, it definitely attracts a special type of person. I think entrepreneurial would be would be a great kind of uh, summarization of of the people that make it to the end, and and some and some that obviously drop out as well. But it definitely attracts people that are uh, that, that accept risk and that are willing to take risk on, and then that transfers into all kinds of successes when they leave. It's a funny thing in the publishing industry as well, because I, I don't think they've caught up really with modern methods. I think they're still living in the past a lot. And this thing about bringing a book out in, in hardback that they still stick to to this day, it used to be a thing that it used to work because there weren't so many authors out there. There weren't so many authors that could just self-publish on Amazon or whatever it is. They had a very select few. They kind of, you know, these publishers ruled the roost so they could afford to say hey the special paperback is out now and if it was a wilbur smith or whatever you know there's a million people immediately just just will will buy it but yeah this day and age with so much competition when you want your book to smack into the market and make an effect and get people talking you know five people talking to five people to five people saying read this book that's that's um the kind of marketing wave that you you want to create but they still stick with this thing because i bet you i bet you've had people already go oh well i'll I'll wait for the paperback yeah they has there's been a few people that have that uh that quite remarkably that they they do prefer the paperback i think in in, just in recent times with technology people are, are more wanting to download books and also listen to the audio there's so many people that are that are that say to me, look, I, I I don't enjoy reading, but I'll I'll get it on audio. So times are changing with it. Uh, they really are, and it's it is quite interesting. Uh, touching on your approach as well in terms of marketing, word of mouth is just so powerful, uh, and that's what I found over this last three or four, maybe five weeks, is just that just somebody as simple as as putting it on Facebook and saying, "Great book," you see the comments underneath, and people like just ordered, just ordered. Really, is it a great book? Uh, and it's it's just so powerful that kind of personal validation or that personal uh, relationship that somebody else has got with somebody else. Uh, that like trust that they've got between themselves. Uh, as soon as that goes up, uh, you get quite some you get some good success from that. Mm. I'm guessing also that probably quite a few disillusioned young men out there um by that i mean you know an office job it's just not and you know, we don't have a lot of industry anymore we, we we don't sort of 
build ships and melt iron and dig coal. So it's kind of funneled everyone into office jobs, isn't it? Sat behind a computer for, for eight hours a day, possibly for a boss that you don't really like. Mm. And I think a lot of people like to live vicariously now through through the armed forces. You know, they're, they're, if I can't join, I, I want to read about it. Or, or maybe they're reading about it because they're thinking, maybe I need a, a, a change of career. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think everybody, no matter who you are, you always want to be better. You always want to learn how to get better mentally and physically. Uh, and I think books like this and other books that are in its kind of field uh, definitely kind of fit that void. I think COVID as well, COVID's played a massive factor in, uh, I think the probably desirability of, of this book as well in, in terms of helping people get back on track, get back into a, into a good mindset. And I think the lessons that I've, that I've kind of put in it are just, it's psychology that hopefully everybody can understand. It's like the, the kind of uh, lay person's understanding of psychology. It's, it's understandings about ourselves that we all know about our own minds, but we don't, it's not reinforced academically. Uh, and that's kind of what I kind of wanted to achieve. But yeah, it's just, I think everybody wants a tool or everybody's always looking for a, a drink or something to make them feel better, something to make them perform better. Everybody's, we all want it, no matter who we are. Yes. And so you're getting on the train to go off to Limpston. And your mum rushes in a bookshop, comes out with a diary and goes, there you go, son, write it all down. This is, uh, this is not an approach I've, I've heard of <laughs> before. No, absolutely not. Uh, it was the most bizarre gift that anybody could have given me. I'm sure I will, like yourself, Chris, when we were younger, we all kind of fit the same mould was young boot next but uh i wasn't academic as a young lad uh, i didn't read i didn't want to read i wasn't very good at reading <clears throat> and when i left of all things on the train just as the train doors were shutting at wakefield westgate my mum gave me literally put this diary in my hand as the door shut and through the window she's just saying just write it down it'll help just write things down i want to see what's going on and train took off and i would just it's like what on earth like crazy mindset. Uh, and as I'm kind of going down on the train to Limston, uh, but you, you know what it's like, mate. You're, you're nervous. You, 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 you don't know what you're doing. You're in a sense of disbelief. And I thought, I'm just going to open it and just write how I'm feeling and see if it settles me, if I, if, see if I feel better. And I did, and I just kind of documented that I felt nervous but excited and that I felt like we're on a roller coaster. Mm. Uh, and... I was strapped in on my way, but all of a sudden you want to get off and you want to stop it, but you can't. Uh, and I wrote it in and kind of from that moment on, I just felt completely compelled to, uh, to keep it. And, and, and that's what I did. It's interesting, mate, reading it as well, because whereas Linston's pretty much the same for everybody, isn't it? It's like a blueprint or maybe there's a more appropriate analogy. But this is obviously getting into your mindset of how you felt as you went through. So immediately I see when you're in the, it's called foundation when you went through, that it's called induction when I went through. They had to change that because induction just sounds like brainwashing. <laughs> <laughs> Which it was. <laughs> <laughs> brainwashing, brainwashing into how to iron properly. Yeah, and shower. Yes, and polish lots of stuff. Um, but I noticed you said you were down, you felt quite down quite a lot. Whereas my experience was I, I, I didn't even have, to, I don't think I had time to, I, I wouldn't have known how to feel down at 18 years old. Mm. To me, every day was a like, certainly in training, every day would just get on and just get through it. And you do allude to that. Um, I notice as you go, go through, but I was kind of, bright eyed you know wide eyed really right what what, what i was very naive as well mm. 
but I had I had the fortunate um, um, the fortunate thing in my corner was I was a bit. Have you ever seen Officer and a Gentleman with Richard? I have. Yeah. And where he's beasting him and he's trying to get him to, was it DOR drop on request? I think they call it. Yeah. And it, and he's like, I want you out of here, mayonnaise. And he's like, but I got nowhere else to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was me because I, I was living in my car. I was basically homeless and living in a Renault 12 when I joined up. So I did, I had nothing else. So I, I didn't have that psychological Oh, I could go home to a nice family. Oh. Now and do... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do Do you think that might be a, more of a modern thing, though? Because people, young men now, are, are are seem to be more sensitive. It's yeah. I, it's a great point, Chris. I think that when we went through in two thousand and five, mobile phones had not long been out and you certainly couldn't get onto the internet like you could now google was uh and certainly getting onto the internet with with efficiency and access was tough if not impossible uh there were still black and white phones with snake uh so but you were still more connected than what you would have been and i think that being connected to society and your support system potentially makes you a bit of a weaker asset and i think more so now with it with the with the with how good connectivity is i mean you're always connected aren't you and i think alluding back to your point i think living in your car i think that's such a strong place to be mentally when you're when you've got nothing in a sense to lose you, you you've got no pulls i just found that when i were in training i had no i had no girlfriend that, and that was, for me, the best place to be. There were so many good lads that you would have tipped at the start uh, to get to the end that left for girls or left for, for other for other kind of family issues, whether genuine or, or not. But, yeah, I think, I think it's a great point. I think, I think the reason why they brought the ROP in was because there were so many uh, young lads getting stress fractures and that's because the skeletal uh, composition is just not tough enough in the lower legs now to withstand the impact from training. They're getting stress fractures. So they brought the ROP in to kind of build, build them up to stop the, the immense dropout rate. And that's all because kids are no longer jumping out of trees, uh, young lads. Uh, they're not playing tigs in the street and hide and seek and stuff. It's more a sedentary lifestyle. And that's, I think that's quite profound, really. Yeah, they're not nicking enough stuff. <laughs> yeah, and do some proper shoplifting like the good old days. Yeah, they're not <laughs> pinching bottles of milk off people's uh, doorsteps and stuff. Yes, yes. Yeah, so ROP is this this is this this pre month now that that we hear about? Yeah, it is. Uh, I think it's from what I've heard. It's it's still it, it, it's it's tough. Uh, I don't think they're ever going to change the the fabric of training, or I hope they, they wouldn't. But it, it's tough, and there's there's a hell of a lot of people that drop out in in ROP as well. It essentially makes training 36, 36 weeks. Mm. But I have heard literally in, in in a number of days that they're they're going to go back to the the PRMC. I think the cost of it, I heard that the cost of the PRMC wasn't cost effective, but uh, I just think it's a fantastic part of the process. Me is the PRMC. Yes, that was called the PRC back in my day. So for friends at home, the ROP is, what does that acronym stand for? Recruit Orientation Phase. Yeah. So this is the bit where apparently lads rocking up at Limpson just don't know what's hit them and um, don't, well, I guess you'd say, don't really have the minerals for for entering what is essentially the toughest military basic training infantry training in in the world in the world not not, not yeah. special forces if i'm talking about like basic uh, infantry level and then um the prc was potential recruits course now called prmc potential rural marines course in my 
God, that was tough enough in Horrific. itself. And to think mm. that during this recent stuff that's been going on, that, that that's been done online. Uh, 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 and I mean, you can't, mm. you can't swap. Bloody hell, first moment there on our three-day PRC, we've thrown ourselves backwards off the high diving board. Right? <laughs> like, like what you see Aunt Middleton getting the, uh, the, the, the candidates to do on SAS. Yeah. We had to do that, just stand there, fall backwards. And if you hesitated, that was it. They'd say, right, go and get the train. Yeah. Then that's followed by an hour swim, just swimming, endless, blooming, uh, swimming around the pool, swimming across the pool, then hit the gymnasium. And I was watching a Dirty Sanchez video the other day when the boys rocked up at Linson and they got beasted and they were all throwing up. It's so, I, that's superb, that, isn't it? Yeah. But I, so funny. But would you agree, when you're in training, you don't throw up. You, you, like, you, you grow with the programme. It's the PRMC that is sh- such a shock to the system. That, that lads was oh. lads were spewing up and just going home. We had lads falling off the ropes on their head, and they 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 were getting sent home. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's, there's lads that there's lads as well. There's lads that pass the PRMC that never go back. There's lads also that pass the PRMC that go down on the train, and then when they stop outside a camp to start training, they stay on it and go home. Yeah, when we that's when we, how that's how intimidating that place is. When we got in the induction block, there was three empty beds. <laughs> three guys hadn't got off, they you know they stayed on the train and wonder what they're doing now. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, it's just an unbelievable, it's an un- unbelievable place, and it and and like just touching on PRMC again, it's like uh, I come on our first day, I mean. The, the first night, although felt quite hostile, the the the, the, ne- the next day you, you is when the when your gym test start and we start with a three mile run and the 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 PTI came in, just kicked the door open at five in the morning, followed by another load of PTIs and one of them kicked a lock of and a load of boots fell out and we had to we frantically racing to put these boots on and I had a size eight on one foot and a ten on the other and it, it was just absolute carnage and then you get beast it was just an unbelievable experience. Yes. And how did you make time for the for the diary? I say this with interest because I was. Uh, this is just going to sound really stupid, but I missed somewhere in the program. I missed a crucial bit of information, and that is that you only wash your shirt like every day in your smalls you don't have to wash your denims and this so there were lads maybe they'd wear their stone shirt on parade for what 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 what, what two hours or something they were just hanging it back up and there's me i mean you know <laughs> mr fucking stupid washing literally everything i wore every single time i wore it and i did that all the way through through training i didn't I didn't. I missed the memo that said you 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 know you, you haven't got to do do that right. So I was up till twelve one o'clock every single night, even up until King Squad. I couldn't work out why there were lads like you know on their bed reading a book or going going ashore. Um, I certainly didn't didn't have time for the diary, but you you clearly made time for it. Yeah, I, I've always had like really bad OCD. Uh, and I have, I've had it from birth. And I, I think this is probably something to do with it. Uh, I played rugby before I went in and I always kind of played, I wanted to master the game with with the perfection and also the perfection side of, of, of OCD. And once I'd started that kind of process on the train, it were almost like I had to continue. And it were almost like an anchor of stability and an uh, an extrinsic an extrinsic motivational factor for me to stay in and complete it because you imagine coming out of training after four or six weeks or midway through with half a diary that is a 
it's an awful reminder of failure is that so it it almost it kept me in uh and it was really tough sometimes sometimes we'd have we'd have been to sleep for days and and, and writing it was was horrific especially when lads were getting in bed uh, and you know sometimes you've only got an hour and a half two hours before you're up again anyway but it were it were just it were tough at times it were it were really tough i mean when i went in the field sometimes i had to write on my arms and on my hands and just little buzzwords that i could then remember that for when i got out and then just kind of document it again but uh but yeah well it, it were a tough one yeah Gareth, were you worried at all that the training team, did they know you were writing it? You know, on my 21st birthday, uh, which came shortly after me uh, me joining about week eight or something like that, uh, I put my cards around my bed and the training team came up and they were like, no effing cards around here and ripped them all up. And uh, literally just ripped them all up and just dropped them in front of me by my feet. Uh, And I'm like, oh, bloody hell. That made me really, really anxious then about them finding the diary. Because I think if I thought if they find this, they're 100% going to rip it up. And at that point, I'd captured some really, really rich, unbelievable stuff in there. Uh, and then all of a sudden, one of the days, they just walked round unannounced. And I was sat on the bed with one lad while I were writing it. And they were like, what's that? And I reluctantly told him and he looked through it and as he's looking for it, I think he's going to wreck pages out any minute. And he was just like, it's hoofing. And they absolutely supported me in continuing it on. And from that moment on, I were able to kind of waterproof it and take it in the field. Don't get me wrong, they never give me the opportunity to write in it. That were, that were up to me to, to kind of find the time. But uh, yeah, they kind of got behind it and that really helped with, with, with completing it. Did you write like, our section court book is incredibly handsome. <laughs> he's like the big brother I never had I absolutely did yeah for next time he came round <laughs> yes um, let's talk about the, uh, my old nemesis we touched on it but before before we recorded uh, the, the endurance course because that for me I don't know I think that epitomised my experience of, of command it was, it was the moment when I understood the difference, you know, what separates the men from the boys. And I guess it's because it's the first time in training pretty much that, that you have to do something on your own, certainly something that's so epic. And yeah. by that, I mean, it's only you and your thoughts that, get, that are going to get you through that course. And everyone's pretty, I wouldn't say physically on a par, because we had some, like, we had Welsh rugby players and they were just freaking hoofing at the fizz, you know? Yeah. Mm. But you've all, you all know you can pass it. It's just whether you can turn that switch in your head. And that, the, 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 I only passed it on the day, so I think I failed two run-throughs. And on that day, I remember thinking, right, do I want this bad enough? Yes. Fucking start running then. <laughs> yeah. And I started yeah. and I didn't, didn't stop. Yeah, it's, I call it in the book, like the day, training is like the daily burden of failure. It's like a massive coat that you wear every day and it's oppressive and it weighs you down. And uh, absolutely, mate, the endurance for me was my nemesis. And I've, put the word nemesis in there as well which is quite unbelievable but yeah I mean I failed every run through uh, partly because my conduct on leave was just atrocious but I failed every run through and when it got to the day there's, there's so many things that can go wrong the, the worst thing about it mate is 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 that you're under time isn't it mm. as soon as you start the time the time's on uh, and you have in a sense you, you haven't got a lot of it and any at any point that you misjudge something, you could say more so on the Taz and the slot cost, but on the endurance as well, you could wrong foot in, you could get get caught on the on the sheep depot, or whatever, and uh, and you're really up against it, and you could fail, and then you've got to get back, and you you're flapping about the shoot, whether your weapon's going to work, and it's just 
your anxiety is through the roof, isn't it? It's just... And it, you just... No matter how mentally tough that you get, and you do get mentally tough throughout training, you never know that you're going to do it until you've literally crossed the bridge on the 30 mile of deer. No. It's just... It's one of them... It, however they've engineered it or whoever's done it, it's just incredible because nobody can profess at any stage that they think that they've got it until you've literally got that green lid on your head at the end. It's Yeah, I can't remember if I did the battle swimming test before or after the 30 miler. I was one of the last people to pass it. It's And they generally do that rerun in the King Squad fortnight or week. I can't remember what we had. Um, but yeah, I can't remember that being it. I can't remember getting like my commando flashes and going, I do remember feeling, yes, result, we've done it. Um, so I guess I must have done the swim by then, but sometimes they keep it to the, and that, I mean, that, if you're a skinny chat, that's, that's the hardest test. Mm. Not, mm. not, not, I mean, you're not blowing out your, but if, what, if you're drowning, you're, yeah, that's kind of quite a bad result, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And I, I, I do know that the, they often chopped and changed it. Uh, I think at one point you did field firing after your commando tests and that rounded off the end of training. But certainly when I went through and I think it had only just changed, you were, the end of training was crossing the bridge and getting your green lid and your, your flashes. Mm. And all I can remember thinking, mate, is I'm just glad it's over. I'm just glad it's over. It wasn't a presentation of the green lid as such, but I was just, I was just so thankful that the nightmare was over. Uh, and it was a nightmare. It was just an absolute, just a brutal, vivid and enduring nightmare that felt like it had gone on all your life, never mind 10 months. Yeah, but yeah. What, I, what an experience. When I was sat on the four tanner coming back from the 30 miler, I still had a, a Snickers bar in my webbing pouch. They called them, they called them mar- marathons back then. And it was because I just had no appetite to eat. You know, we were just pushing it, pushing it, pushing it so much. I just couldn't face eating a bloody bar of, bar of chocolate um i do remember getting on the phone going i've done it dad he went oh yeah all right son da, 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 da. You're like, what <laughs> yeah yeah but you know th- there were a point on it where we'd, we'd gone up the up the up the hill from old campton barracks and it was like a real fast speed march pace up this mile or one one and a half mile gradient and my legs were just like lead and I just felt like we're not even a mile in and I'm absolutely hanging out here and then we got to 12 mile checkpoint and not even halfway and I was absolutely busted up and broken and like you said you get into all these checkpoints then this every, every six mile checkpoint and you're you're not feeling great and you, you, you can't eat, can you, mate? It's, it's, it's weird. You're, like, you're literally, you're so dry mouthed and you're like, adrenaline's just, you, you're eating, but you're like, you're like having to swill it down with water. It's, it, oh, it's just a, just an unbelievable test is that. I underestimated it. I thought I had it in the bag, the 30 miler. Once I'd got there, I thought easy, just head down and just plod on. But, oh no, it, it caught me out. Yes. And what are you up to now, then, Gareth? Because, um, well, we chatted earlier, and I, I'm proud to say you're, you're a, a, a spiritual guy, which is, I think, is one thing demonstrating you've got an elite mindset, which we've, we've all done. But then it's taking it to the next level in life, isn't there? You know, you can go through life resting on your laurels because you got a green lid when you were 18 or in your case or 19 in your case 21 um but there's a lot more to life isn't there there really is mate you know i started studying psychology when i was 20 28 
before that, I'd always been really intrigued by it. Uh, I've always been like a really, really deep thinker and always wanted to kind of work things out, especially myself. And that's this is kind of where it all started. So when I was a young lad, I was uh, just like a burning fire, a ferocious burning fire. I had, in a sense, disregard for, for many really and only regard for few and I wanted to work out who that boy was and also why I had such a propensity to to want to go and experience war and in a sense had such a lack of empathy at that age and I thought oh look I'm going to go down a, a line of inquiry of forensic psychology just to see what it's all about why are we so uh, in a sense predisposed to want to inflict harm on each other and destroy everything that we've got around us uh, in gen- in a more general kind of sense. Mm. And it just absolutely, I mean, I started it. Uh, I didn't think at all I could do it, but I just applied the same kind of mindset that I had done in the Marines uh, of just getting there, head down, take a few weeks off and let's see how far we can get. And throughout it, I just became absolutely fascinated into I suppose, in a sense, our existence and what's the meaning of it and what we're doing and uh, just really trying to work it out. And I'm still trying. I think I'll always be, I'll always be trying to work it out. I'll I'll never be kind of satisfied of my understanding of things, Mm -hmm. the meaning, the meaning of things. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, my, my kind of, uh, I suppose, fascination with, with, with with humanity really just came from a, a, a wanting to understand myself better and why I was a particular person. Yeah, I, I guess for, I would say young people, but probably a lot of people, if not most, that they'd be surprised, wouldn't they, to learn that um, Limpson Commander doesn't make a warrior. It, 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 it makes people that can go, go to war. But what makes a warrior is reading books. I think that, would you agree, that would probably surprise most people? Absolutely. I think there's so much of life that you don't know uh, and you can quite easily be, I think in a sense, fall into the illusion of of what what society has, has socially created. And it's only like when you start reading books, I think, powerful books that resonate with you, especially the stuff that I, that I read about in psychology on stuff like bystander effect and on class structure and where it all comes from and just everything, really. Uh, it just expands your mind and you start being critical with what, what you're seeing around you. Uh, and your evaluation is... I think of, of those in those that information's in depth. And it just broadens it just broadens your horizons. And, and I, I can just remember even now, like when I put the lessons into the book, the lessons kind of emerged from the weeks. The construct the construct of masculinity, lesson two, uh, looking at recruit Nero and, and stuff like that. And Savannah type environments looking at uh I was sensors are not evolved to live in urban environments yet, even even after all the after all these years. It's all stuff that we all should know. Yeah. But yet we don't we we don't get taught it in school. And I'm just I just can't believe it. It's almost like I want to get these six or eight books that I've got from my time at uni and just sit people down and make them make them ingest it. Because it would make the world and society such a better place it'd help us with our climate response uh and and just everything else like that like we touched on before mate in terms of uh eating habits what we're supposed to be putting into his bodies just everything it'd make us such better people if we just had just a tiny bit of academic material inside us yes unfortunately the um the matrix is controlled, isn't it? By pe- I, I, my kind of thinking there is sociopaths, psychopaths, mix of the two. But 
like if you can't know love you can't pick up a baby and feel that oh you know that there's you should be protecting this and if you're a psychopath or you sociopath you you can't have that you just by definition you you so you're like and so you're going through the motions going uh uh hello hello <laughs> uh, yeah it's, it's and, true and True. if you can never know love of your fellow human beings, then all you've got in your life is control. You know, yeah. you're never going to get the satisfaction of being an enlightened individual that can just love all people and 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 your maybe not your every action, but but you you, you try to make your action about um, about being the best you can be for others. But if you don't possess you, that emotion because you're not born with it or mm. you're, you, you were psychologized as an infant into not, you know, by a, by a bullying corporate trillionaire father that, that, that this is the way he did it. And you see, you see this in people like the, the Bush family and, 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 and so on and so forth. Very, very robotic. Ah, this utter disregard and, and incompassion mm utter disregard for human life well then the only way you can get your kicks in life is through control so it's the complete opposite end of the scale and it's these controllers that 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 um they control everything like you say they control the the education system they control what we understand about diet i mean you take psychology so you've got um, famous, you know, the, the famous psychologists there talking about was it id, ego, super ego. They never talk about being caught a set of carbon molecules fr- flying through the atmosphere, do they? You know, they, they, they want to keep you in that, that birth certificate identity. Trying to make sense of the world is this individual that's so bloody self in, and, and but not mm-hmm. understanding is such a bigger thing going on here and then yeah. until you can detach from being you know chris or gareth you you you, you you're never going to um uh self-actualize as in reach the the pyramid of your of what what you were put on the planet to be or what you were put in, in the universe to be um and i think it's brilliant to that two bootnecks can have this conversation Absolutely, mate. I think again, like we spoke before we came on. I mean, if you if you if you look at if you look at the scientific basis of existence, we we we're just manifestations of the universe that are, embody the intelligence and and uh, an awareness to reflect back upon ourselves and try and understand the universe, try, trying to understand itself. It's it's so quite unbelievable. And you're you're you and I'm me. No, you're me and I'm you. It's why I wish you all the success because we're both this, we're, we're both the universe just trying to understand each other, isn't it? Just just trying to work it out, mate. Yeah, just trying to work it out. And the the, the thing is, and, and this is this comes down to empathy as well, uh, and it touches on your last point. It's there's the people like if you want to use Bush and his family as an example. Yeah, he's a he's, you could say he's a successful guy. He's, he's reached the top and. Uh, you, many would say that he's well travelled, but he's not really. He's lived in a bubble, uh, and a lot of people live in bubbles, uh, whether it's a village bubble or, or whatever. It's not until you get out there and you expose yourself to different things and different cultures and different ways of living and thinking that you you kind of develop this awareness. Uh, and in developing that awareness, and it, 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 people are often baffled by the fact that Royal Marines are servicemen have got empathy because the stereotype is is that everybody thinks that you're just this mindless killer that's got no kind of intelligence whatsoever but it's completely inaccurate and i think the education that's the ref regiment (laughs) but it's uh it's uh education it's education is don't, don't they say you've got to witness some extreme poverty in your life to understand yourself mm. and on that subject 
Can, can we talk about Afghanistan? Sure, mate. How, how was your experience over there? Yeah, so, I mean, unbelievably, mate, I never went with a car. And, it, and, and I did want to go. Uh, I kind of begged to go at the, at the very start of it when I left training. But the drafts just didn't work out. So what I did was uh, I applied to get into hostile uh, close protection for, a, for about two or three years. And all of a sudden I got uh, Iraq with Olive Group and Afghanistan with a company called Tor that had a, a DOD contract, Department of Defence contract. And I went out there in 2013 for a year uh, working in Kabul. And it's... I've been I've operated like around Somalia, Egypt, and Iraq and stuff. But Afghanistan is the cherry on the cake in terms of hostility, and a place that just is. It's like a nightmare. Is the only way to describe it. Everybody you'd feel that wants to kill you. Uh, and you know what we we saying that though, which is quite contradictory. That one of the key things that when we were working with the interpreters and, and people like that, because we, what we were doing were, we were training the Afghan National Army how to use radios. We were protecting the engineers, training them how to use radios uh, in classrooms, which was vastly unsuccessful because they were all asleep. But uh, they all wanted a better life. That's one thing that they all fundamentally want, a better life. They didn't want the Taliban at all. They were all scared to death of them. Uh, and they were scared to death that the, the West, mainly the Americans, would, would leave. And all we did for that year was reassure them that it wouldn't happen. And it's happened in, in the worst kind of way ever. Uh, and it's just, absolute, it's just absolutely tragic. I mean, three of my mates from training, there were 11 of us that passed out at the end. And three got killed within the first, I think, 24 months of training. And I was speaking to Ben Reddy's mum just when I was going to send a copy of the book and uh, she was just lost for words. Couldn't believe. Clutching at straws as to the meaning of it, what, why it happened. But I don't know, mate. I just, I just, for me, look, being optimistic about it, there's been 20 years of, of un-Taliban, in a sense, occupation in terms of power. And I'm just hoping that, that them two generations that have never experienced the Taliban will one day grow up and elicit positive change in the country. Long shot, but it's the only hope that I think they've got. Yeah, you might want to look into the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and how Americans... No, Sounds really wrong saying that. I don't mean the servicemen. I mean that country was was used to go in there and smash the place up, and make a bad name for themselves, to then allow the Chinese to walk in and go, "Hi guys, right? Do you want to do business with us?" And the Taliban are going to go, "Oh yeah, you know, fine, we'll do that." And it's essentially the Belt and Road is a super highway between Europe and China for goods and goods and services mm -hmm. um, and it's all part of what Orwell would have called the super states creating super states that are going to constantly be played off against um, against one another I'm only saying this not not out of any disrespect for anyone that gave their all or, 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 or got injured but you know mm. the, the, the kids that are next generation they need to know what war is really all about. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is why I say warriors read books. Yeah. Um, you know what, mate? It's, it's. I, I, in a sense, become disillusioned with the whole thing from being in the military to being in, in, in CP as well, private security, hostile private security. It's just not worth it. No. It's just, no, none of it's worth it. And look, Again, another misconception is, is that you go out and I get so many me negative messages on, on my posts of people saying, oh, you're a governmental hit man. You, you went to work for the Queen and she don't care about you. I went, to, I went for me. 
I wanted to go to war for me, nobody else. I wasn't fighting for the queen. I was just fighting for me and the lads around me. That's that's it was for, it was kind of for nobody else. But once I became disillusioned with it, I just it, I just think that now the older me, life's so precious. Uh, just getting here and uh, having having that self awareness that you're alive, and to, for that to be ripped from you, uh, I mean, it's just. I, I just don't see where the where the worth is. No, remember what I said. Some people are born; they can't experience love, kindness, and then they, that's not an option for them. The only option is control, and that's what we're seeing in the world, isn't it? On a on a glo- global scale, control through fear, creating all these false falsities, and because they also control the education system. So they're very good at keeping people in their ego mind. Well, you know, psychology, when you're, when you, when you live out your ego, you're full of bitterness, anger, hate, fear, jealousy, you're subject to your, your animal desires, all, all what um, ancient Eastern scriptures would call your lower self, all the stuff that's not good that keeps you with the beasts and all the love, the kindness, the empathy, the, 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 the healthy eating, the da-da-da-da. But they can't have that. They can't have people that live in their upper self because they'd have no one to go and fight these, these wars. So this answers your question about why in education are we not teaching, you know, we, we teach kids that six apples plus four apples minus ten oranges is that stuff they're never going to use in their life. Mm. They don't teach them that from birth you're a, you're a sovereign human being under the universe. You, you know, you're perfect as you are. Um, you just need to go, go out in the world and, and self-actualize and, and be all that you deserve to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't see that, do we? We just see angry road rage, people trying to get ahead in their company. If someone else gets the position, oh, the bloody, it's just this constant... Um, constant state of fear and order out of uh, order out of chaos yeah it's a difficult one isn't it i mean it's not long between you before you're knocking on the door of, of retirement in a lot of respects it happens it, it just like my life just seems to be speeding towards that now and uh you, you get to a, a point where you you, I, you just want to find happiness uh, and, and contentment. Uh, I look at my parents, and uh, my old man's retired now, but my my mum's still working, and she's six to sixty odd, and she's saying, oh, "I'd love to retire." It's just you kind of just think, "Well, what's well, what's the point in it all?" It's it's just a, a real point of, I suppose, reflection for me at the minute. I'm just really wanting to. Just, just, just kind of find some meaning for for, for where I am and where I want to be. I, I, I just want to kind of carve my own path out, really. Yeah. Well, hopefully we can work together on that because that's, you know, um, um, I think we can support each other in this in this direction. I've mm-hmm. actually, um, I've actually coached, I think, four lads now through Limston. I think all, all four of them were in hunter troops, so the remedial injury troop or, um, or people that are struggling with stuff. And uh, yeah, they have a chat with your uncle, Chris. I'll tweak a couple of things, mate, mate. They've all got their green lids now. So, and, and they all were going to leave. Really? Uh, yeah. Wow. So That's friend- incredible, mate. So we, uh, I've got like a, a pre-military performance kind of training program thing that that, that men and women come onto, young 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 lads and women come onto, and yours is what you've done there is is quite remarkable, mate. And you need props for that because uh, for us and I do all the psychology on it. Trying to get people into training and through training is tough. It is tough. People uh, have their own thoughts and their own rationale for why they either want to continue or or drop out. So getting four people through mate is is a fantastic achievement yeah 
and also you know i'm not might sound a bit hip, hypocritical because i think people know my thoughts on the military industrial complex um but it's not really because they're you know m- my support rubs off on them in o- other ways if you know what i mean I'm, I'm getting them to think a bit like laterally um so when you're there you're in your military role you can be going hmm what's actually really going on in this situation and did you um did you know brad by any chance andy bradsell he worked for olive he he got killed in mosul no i didn't mate i didn't i didn't actually do any work for olive uh, i went uh, down for the interview i got offered the job but i i chose the the role in afghan instead yeah i got you yeah and that is some thing to live through for you alone, let alone everyone else involved, three people out of 11. Mm. I've put it in the diary, mate, uh, after Final X. They lined up the originals, of which at that point there were 11, uh, and just have said statistically, uh, two or three of you will get killed in your first 12 months of being out of training. And unbelievably, mate, it came true. It absolutely came true. And I mean, Tom, who was uh, kind of a Desi Oppo in, in training, he was the commando medalist. Uh, and what's funny about it is at the start of training, I gave him, they said, they gave us all a KFS, a knife, food and sport uh, fork, and said, give this to a lad that visually looks like he's going to fail. Uh, and I give mine to Tom, uh, as did a lot of other people, because he was just like a big fat teddy bear, really. Uh, fast forward 32 weeks and he got the commando medal and I voted for him so it was just remarkable such a strong oh sorry mate okay we on such such a strong individual Uh, and yeah it was just it's tough and you know I I think although we we only spent 10 months together uh, and that's where our friendship were forged. He's off. I think about him more or less every day, or, or often. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. And his mum and dad have never got over it. His mum, especially, is just still to this day just in a bad place. Yeah, it's beyond belief, isn't it? it yeah. You know what? What can you say? Well. All I'll say is, it, it, you know, is, is it worth it to make George Bush, Tony Blair and all the rest of the war criminals even more rich and powerful than they already are? I, I think that's a no-brainer, isn't it? Mate, based on what we've seen over this last four weeks, uh, it was categorically not worth it. Well, it, yeah, but a psychopath it is, believe me. Their plan is well un- well underway. You know, they, they they meet behind closed doors to plan all this shit. Yeah. You know, and it's ah, it's one factor in a whole mm. complex web of deceit. But um, people are waking up to it, and veterans are waking up to it now, which is the the, the best thing. Yeah, yeah. I think I think recent events have done a big job of that. Yes. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Mm. Um, you know, we essentially all signed up for freedom, didn't we? That was the, that was, it wasn't really for the queen. It was, we were obviously it's for, for an experience, but we, I, when I was in, um, conflict, you know, not, I'm not being political now, but I, I did like to think that we were the good guys and we were on, you know, we were doing the right thing for future generations and to see how those freedoms are, they've all just been, they've been stomped on at at, at, at a frightening rate. Um, We've just, we've, we've let the Afghan people down. Uh, And I'm not just saying it because that's what everybody, that's the right thing to say on, on camera. I actually believe it. The, the Afghan people that I met were, really really superb people that don't fit the stereotype of whatever kind of refugee you want to say or whatever 
or the process of othering somebody else. They were fantastic people and we've just massively let them down. Uh, and I think had we have taken care of them, it kind of makes the sacrifice worthwhile then. Let's finish on a more positive note, shall we? What's um what what what's the future for you for you, mate? <clears throat> well, I'm just seeing how this goes, Chris, to be honest, mate. I've been quite, like I said, just blown away by how it's been received. Uh men and women, and also women that are just coming forward and saying, There we go, that are saying that look at this resonates with me when I had a uh a bad first couple of years of motherhood with me with my son just all messages like that so it's really kind of touched a nerve across like the the entire section of what what you what you could say is society so i'm just i'm just really delighted mate uh i will write again uh i, I un, under reflection i started writing when i was 20 with a diary so uh it's kind of not my first time although it's my first time published so i do want to write again uh what about i don't know but it's i've certainly it's been a difficult but i've enjoyed the enjoyed the journey got a clothing range uh, 0.1 projects that uh we look at extreme kind of crossfit and outdoor adventure and stuff like that still in development still growing nicely but we're gonna kind of pull the trigger on that more so towards back in the year so just writing just being creative and thinking uh and, and study I'll definitely do some more study at some point as well so just trying to live a good life mate and, and just be happy and find contentment so can we'll put a link for your merchandise below the video as well yeah I certainly will mate I certainly will it'd be a pleasure good yeah you should, I should have asked you to send me a t-shirt when you sent me this wonderful book mate I'll get one out to you I'll get one out to you you legend legend yeah Gareth what can I say really well done on the book um but equally you know well done on getting yourself to a good and positive place and and um yes i w I, I wish you all the, all the best and feel free to come back on the podcast and, and let us know how it's all going i certainly will mate thank you mate it's been a great pleasure hey. and i've been I've, I've been waiting to to kind of jump on this and have a have a chinwag for, for quite some time. So thanks for the invite, mate. It's, oh, it's greatly pleasure. appreciated. I, I'm going to ask you what everyone asked me. Who, who Who's going to play you in Hollywood? Uh, well, if it, if it were The Voice, it would be Morgan Freeman. Uh, and for the uh, for the act, it's got to be Tom Hardy, right? He loves, he loves, the, uh, he loves the Marines as well, I, I hear. Yeah. So, yeah. Mate, remember it's order out of chaos, so they'd they'd get someone like Angelina Jolie playing you, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And to all our friends at home, massive love to you all. Thank you so much um, for watching another episode of the Bought the T Shirt podcast. If you could please like and subscribe and share this video, that'd be wonderful. Thank you.